Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to this week's session on the introduction to linguistics. We'll talk about phonetics three and I chose to talk about phonology. So to this end, uh, what I would like you to take away from this session is um, that you're able to describe the difference between phonology and phonetics, which um, relates to the difference um, of phonemes and allophones. Uh, so we've been using these terms for the last couple of weeks without actually going into details what the difference is. So as a recap, um, part number one, two sessions ago, I made this distinction in notation. And uh, I said that square brackets and slanted brackets um, have to do with anything concerning sound, um, whereas the angle brackets are left for orthography if we want to make that distinction. For the square brackets and the slanted brackets, I didn't say what the difference is, and I said I'd come back to it. So this is what we um, talk about in this context, right? So the slanted brackets tend to be used in phonology and the square brackets are used for phonetic properties of sound. As a second type of recap, uh, we established over the last couple of sessions the so-called phoneme inventory of English, the sound system of English. We described it in terms of production for the 24 consonants and for the 20 vowels that we have, 12 monophthongs and eight diphthongs. But we didn't really say why we chose these sounds and not other sounds that may be part of um, the language. So for instance, in one of the exercises, uh, we had the glottal stop that you find in better as a variant of better. But the glottal stop doesn't appear in any of the um, tables that you will find for the sound system of English. Now that's odd at first sight because the glottal stop is clearly used by native speakers of English even in standard English, yet we don't include it in a table on the phonemes or the sounds of English. And why is that? This is one question that we want to address, and it ultimately boils down to the third type that we will look at, which is about phonemic contrast. Okay, so today's session will be slightly longer than normal, but um, that's mainly due to some interviews I have at the end where we go into phonemic contrast in other languages languages, because when we talk about the sounds of English, um, these sounds are specific, language specific to English. Okay, so phonetics, phonology, the main distinction is that in phonetics, you talk about how you make sounds, the physical properties, place of articulation, manner of articulation, uh, voicing, whereas in phonology, we talk about how you use the sound. So now we move on to a functional uh, level or the mental organization of sounds. Because when you think about it, language is basically a jumble of sounds, the so-called phones. If I were to ask you to each make an R sound, that sound will uh, differ from person to person depending on your physical properties. So the acoustic signal is very different between people, yet we all categorize that as an R uh sound, meaning is that we mentally organize the jumble into abstract categories. Now that's what we call um, the phonemes. So phonology generally is uh, studied on two main levels. As one is the segmental phonology, which is what we're going to talk about today mainly. Um, when we talk about the phonemes, which are idealized sounds and um, their in environmental behavior in terms of allophones, right? How do they behave in certain environments? The other part is suprasegmental phonology, so you move beyond the segment, uh, in which you study the combination of sounds, most notably in syllables, <coughs> in phonotactics, that's the way how you combine sounds, right? So German, for instance, is famous for allowing a per and an s at the beginning of a syllable, such as in psychologie, whereas in English you'd have psychology. Even though you have the per in writing, um, it is not pronounced, right? So because that combination of sounds in uh, the onset of a syllable is um, not permitted, it's not used. Other items would be um, linking, how you link sounds to make fluent speech, because clearly we don't um, utter individual sounds uh, to make speech, um, which is also connected to assimilation. So we'll talk a bit about assimilation. Um, stress would be a factor that you study in suprasegmental phonology and intonation. Okay, so 
what is the main part of phonology? So the main part is phonemic analysis. You want to identify the phonemes. So the main question here is how do we determine the sound uh, system of a language, which sounds belong to a language and uh, which do, don't. So first up, we have a definition. A sound is a phoneme of a language if it is contrastive. That means if it changes meaning. Or in other words, a phoneme is a meaning distinguishing element. Now, you may be familiar with such a definition from uh, morphology, if you've already had phonology, um, where we said that the morpheme is a meaning-bearing element. So that's a, um, parallel to the phoneme as a meaning-distinguishing element. Now, to find out the phonemes as meaning-distinguishing elements, we use minimal pairs. So minimal pairs are pairs of words, or real words, um, that have the same number of segments. They differ in exactly one of these segments, and they also differ in meaning. So, for instance, um, cat, cut, sun, sung, light, bite. So these are pairs of words that fulfill all these three criteria, and you've already identified um, six sounds of English that way. So we'll have a little exercise to begin with in determining as many phonemes of English as you can by using the word beer. Right, so to illustrate the usefulness of beer for phonetic phonemic analysis is um, for the consonants, try to exchange the b for any other sound, and for the vowels, exchange the ear for any other sound. That's okay, come up with pairs of words that would identify sounds of English. Now, I gave you that exercise before, and if you haven't done it, uh, pause the video and come back in a couple of minutes. Okay, so you probably came up for the consonants um, with something like this. I identified 17. Cheer, dear, fear, gear, hear, jeer, ridiculing. Leer, to look with sexual desire or malicious intent. Mia, near, seer, tear, peer, rear, sheer, weir, year, and veer. So veering off the road. Uh, plus the b for beer. If you except zero elements, then possibly you m also had ear on your list. Um, that is open to debate, if whether you accept zero elements. Um, I wouldn't, because ear has fewer sounds than beer, uh, because I don't count zero elements as an element in this particular context, but that would be open to debate. For the vowels, you probably came up with um, something of this um, set. Um, 11 vowels plus the ear, vowel, uh, boer, bear, bow, 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 boy, by, bay, bear, and beer. Um, that's for the diphthongs. And for the monothongs, you may have identified three long vowels, b, boo, and ba. Um, you shouldn't have identified, at least I couldn't find any, and it has to do with the um, sound structure or syllable structure of English, any of the short vowels, because short vowels do not occur uh, feliciously in um, open syllables. And we are dealing here with an open syllable, right? It has a consonant and a vowel, so open syllable. <coughs> now, for some words, finding minimal pairs is a bit difficult, and that leads to discussion over their phonemic status. Um, so, for instance, for the dental fricatives, it's a bit difficult, but you do find uh, words that form minimal pairs that tell you you are dealing with um, a phonemic contrast, a meaning contrast between thigh and thy, loath and loathe, um, or teeth and teeth. Okay, so you do have that um, meaning distinguishing element. Um, for other sounds that we also discussed um, in the Africans, whether um, we should actually consider them one sound or the combination of two sounds. Um, similar to the argument that we made about diphthongs, we could also make about these affricates. Um, they're not a random combination of just any two consonants um, that behave like a phonemic sound. So the de and the je, and the t and the sh, to make to give you j and sh and ch, um, they are the only two consonants that systematically occur um, behaving like um, a single sound, which is why we consider them one sound rather than uh, two sounds, and they are also meaning distinguishing um, there. Okay, that way, if you do it back and forth, um, you can arrive at 
um, around 24 consonants and 20 vowels for standard British English. Um, some textbooks will give you a different number that depends on tiny details um, of whether you consider one sound phonemic or not. So it's not a clear-cut distinction. And we are describing here a standard variety. Uh, so if you did any of the um, uh, geographical varieties of English would actually look very uh, different. And you had some examples of how the varieties of English differ um, in the lecture video. Um, English is very comparable to German in the size of its phoneme inventory. So in German has more con um, consonants but fewer vowels and German also has three um, diphthongs whereas English, um, RP English has um, eight. <coughs> but together they are relatively similar and they're sort of in the average range um, or in the middle of how languages exploit the possibilities in their phoneme inventories, right? So that's a language specific thing and some languages have very few and some have very uh, many um, phonemes. So for instance, uh, TAR has, um, depending on um, estimate and analysis, anywhere between 75 and well over 100 phonemes, uh, which depends a little on whether you count certain non-pulmonic sounds as phonemes of that language. And then Rotokas, um, that's a language spoken in Papua New Guinea, um, is famous for having the smallest inventory of phonemes, um, which is currently uh, challenged by Pidahan, which is a language in the Amazon, uh, which is claimed to have only 10 uh, phonemes, so three vowels and seven uh, consonants. But that is still, uh, the jury is still out uh, there. But what you see is that languages differ very um, greatly on how they um, exploit the physical or phonetic properties or possibilities um, that we can have. Okay, I just had to uh, put the sun shades down because it is getting um, a little <laughs> annoying with the sun right in my face. Okay, so with um, phonology where we clearly uh, see that the last couple of weeks in phonetics, we were using phonology knowledge without explicitly referring to it. Um, how does phonetics influence um, our phonology um, analysis? So if you take the cur in kip, cop, and crop, kip, cop, and crop, you may have noticed that they are slightly different, although they're phonetically similar, voices, vila, plosives. Um, but they are different. So for the K and Kip, Kip, Cop, you should feel a puff of air. So th that K is pronounced with air where that is absent in the crop um, example. The K in Cop is slightly further back than in Kip, right? If you say Cop, Kip, Cop, Kip, Cop, Kip, cop, you may be feeling your tongue moving forwards and backwards as you alternate between the two words. Now, why is that? Well, in cop, what follows is an o sound, which is a back vowel. So your tongue moves backwards in the anticipation of the o sound, which makes it slightly um, further back. And for the e sound in kip, um, your tongue will have to move forward. So um, your tongue already prepares for the production of the e. The same argument holds for the difference in cop compared to kip in terms of lip rounding, right? So cop, you already have your lips slightly rounded. Why? Because the o sound is rounded. Whereas for kip, you an unrounded vowel, um, your, uh, your, your mouth will, your lips will not be uh, rounded. So here we have different variants of the phoneme k that we call allophones. So let's talk a bit about um, allophones. So allophones versus phoneme pertains to the question, do we deal with different sounds or with variation of the same sound? And the uh, word allophone may remind you of the term allomorph, where we talked about different variants of one morpheme. So um, with the phoneme and the allophone, we can make that distinction. A phoneme is a different sound, such as ker and ul, and an allophone is variants of the same sound, right? So for ker, we can have non-aspirated ker, we can have aspirated ker. For the l in the lecture last week, you had um, the example of a clear l and a dark l, right? Pill would be slightly darker than uh, lip, for instance. 
And the phones also is refers to the concrete realization, so um, each individual instance. You can think about the distinction between phonemes and allophones or the distinction between phonology as a mental abstract category and phonetic as a concrete uh, physical realization um, in terms of um, um, clothing, right? So, for instance, uh, you may have um, different socks, right? They, be, they can be unicolor, they can have dots on them, they can have stripes on them, they can have little animals on them. But despite their differences, you all recognize them as socks. And if you have some um, minimal um, organization in your wardrobe, you'd put them um, in a different uh, drawer. Uh, so they have a specific function, the socks, right? That's different. It's a different function to um, undies. So your undies might come in different uh, shapes and sizes, but you use undies for quite a different purpose than you use um, socks. So the the but but we all recognize them as functionally um, functional categories, and we put them into different um, categories. So that's more or less what happens with um, the distinction between uh, phonemes and allophones. Is that different variants um, of the same phoneme would still classify as a particular phoneme? Okay, one distinction that we um, need to address uh, briefly in the context of phonemes versus allophones um, is free variation. Um, allophones are generally defined, and that's what we get to in a couple of minutes, um, as being predictable variants of the same sound. Now, free variation is not fully predictable, at least not predictable from the phonetic environment. So um, what is uh, free variation? If you take the example vase, some people pronounce it vase, some people pronounce it vase, and vase is also a possible pronunciation. So you may think that these vowels are allophones of some other vowel because they don't distinguish meaning. But we know from other minimal pairs that they are, in fact, phonemes, right? So pa, paw, and pay um, are clearly different in meaning. So we've established that these are the phonemes of English, but for the vase example, you have variation and speakers can choose which one um, they use. So this variation is not fully predictable by the phonetic environment. It may be predictable sometimes by uh, geographical and social variation, but not from a phonetic uh, point. So some um, words just have more than one pronunciation within a speech community or beyond uh, speech communities, um, such as the German variation in the R sound, right? Um, so you, you have some geographical indicators that some areas have more rolling R's than, than other areas, but generally that is um, a free variation um, part. And this is more or less what we also put in the glottal stop, which is not the meaning distinguishing, right? Better, better, it's, it's a variant of the same uh, ter sound, um, although you do find social and geographical um, groups where this is more likely to have the glottal stop um, as a variant of the ter sound. So what do we mean by being predictable in the phonetic environment is the following. So um, when we talk about complementary distribution, we define an allophone as um, follows. So two allophones of one phoneme are in complementary distribution if they predictably do not occur in the same environment. Okay, so we can make statements about, we can predict where one occurs and not um, the other. So if you say, for instance, Peter Parker, Peter, and Spider-Man, you may have noticed a difference in the way you say per. Now that is predictable, um, and you can um, remember this distinction um, very well in using Peter Parker and Spider-Man. So here we talk about um, variations of the per sound that occur in predictable environments, which are mutually exclusive. Now, how does that work? So the, um, I'll give you two examples. The first one is um, the phoneme er, which has different realizations. Uh, so you can have a, a voiced er, so it's normally a voiced uh, sound, and a voiceless uh, variant. Now the textbook gives the following um, three words, a spectrogram of the following three words, and the er sound in question um, we talk about here. So you see that for the first two, um, they're visibly the same, whereas the second one, or the, sorry, the third one is noticeably different. And um, because I wanted to find out how, just how different they really are, I recorded myself, and I'm going to play this back to you. Okay. 
rip, wrap, trip. Right, so you notice three words. You all recognize them, all three sounds as an R sound, I hope. And I isolated the R sound um, just as in the in the previous um, on the previous slide. Right, that's the two er sounds that sound very similar. Now, to contrast, the er and trip looks different and it sounds very different. Tri yeah, that's a very different er sound compared to the other. So I'm going to play them back to back. Trip. That was still Trip. in the same in the same word. Rap. So here we have something very odd. Um, the phonetic signal is vastly different, yet you probably all recognize them in context that they all you all put them into your R drawer, um, which is quite bizarre. So what's happening here? If you that is not a coincidence, it's not just me. This would happen with any native speaker or anyone um, who speaks English um, very fluently, is that they've mastered um, a phonological rule uh, that applies to English. So if you did it with other words, you would probably come to the realization, make the observation that whenever t, p, and k precedes the r, um, you have a, 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 a voices or a devoiced r, I should say, um, whereas in all other contexts, um, you have the normal uh, voiced. Okay, and the second example is the aspiration on the per, right? So with the same phoneme per, which comes with two allophones, the aspirated one and the non-aspirated one, as the Peter Parker Spider-Man example. And uh, I recorded myself for saying pin and uh, spin. Pin, spin, Okay, so you would agree we have um, two purrs, basically. Now, I isolated the purr and played them back to you. Pin, pin, right? So you hear the aspiration. Bin, bin, pin, bin. Right, so in the second example, there is no aspiration at all. It almost sounds like a burr. And that is because per and per are very, very similar. Uh, so the only distinction is that we could say per is voiced and per isn't. But phonetically, they're very similar. And in fact, and it's not voicing per se that is on the per, at least not in English. It's more that the following vowel, which is voiced, comes a lot quicker, and which is why we perceive the per as being uh, voiced. So for this example, if I played, um, if I played a, the last part, Bin, bin, that sounds like bin, right? So if you chop off the S sound, it sounds like bin, um, which is a remarkable fact because you, you heard that it was the full word that was uttered, but you perceive it very differently depending on the phonetic context. Spin, that's not an illusion, um, and I'm not trying to trick you, that's phonetic, the difference between a phonetic signal and how we perceive them, um, which has to do with the environment and with regularity that you have internalized as being uh, part of the language, right? So um, when we talk about allophone or allophonic variation, we talk about di predictable distribution based on some phonological rules. So for instance, um, for aspiration, you could say that all the um, voiceless plosives, per, ter, and ker, they're aspirated if they occur at the beginning um, of a syllable and are not preceded by a consonant, whereas they're not aspirated if um, they uh, follow directly, uh, follow the consonant. So spin is not aspirated because it is followed by um, a consonant. So with this whole aspiration, that these are allophones because they don't change meaning, whether you produce or whether you pronounce uh, the k with aspiration in cat doesn't change the meaning of cat. If you don't aspirate cat or the cur in cat, um, it will sound very odd and it's it's actually very difficult to produce um, the cur in cat without aspiration. 
Um, but it still is cat, so we're not meaning distinguishing um, elements uh, there. So if, if I try to pronounce cat without the aspiration, it would probably sound something similar to gat. Right, so k, g, the voiceless voice distinction. Um, so similar to the um, spin, bin um, uh, difference. Okay, so now we talked about these allophonic properties, right? So aspiration in English is not meaning distinguishing, although it's so predictable and we do it all the time without r actually realizing. In some contexts, in some languages, aspiration is uh, meaning distinguishing. And um, so when we say that what we consider to be allophonic um, can be phonemic, can be meaning changing in other languages. And to illustrate that, I um, talked to two of my former students um, who are now master students at the Freie Universität Berlin. And uh, yeah, first up is uh, Yu Jung, who is a s native speaker of Korean. Thanks for being around here, Yu Jung, for this um, <laughs> little illustration in uh, these times. And you have uh, prepared some examples. So let us hear about your um, example. Right. So my first example is na pita gidario, na pita gidario. The two words are pizza and pizza. And perhaps you c might not hear it, but there is a very clear distinction between the first sentence, with me which means I'm waiting for my visa, and the second sentence, which means I'm waiting for pizza. My second example is kogi puri nasso, kogi puri nasso, pur and pur. So now, same, same sounds. Kogi puri nasa means there was a fire, and kogi puri nasa means there was grass. <laughs> and now my final example is kusarami pianessa, kusarami pianessa, pianessa, pianessa. And the first sentence means he or she changed as a person, he or she is not the same person anymore. And the second example is. Um, this was somebody that I was comfortable with. This was somebody that I could trust. Okay, <laughs> um, awesome. Um, that that is so difficult to hear. Um, I mean, really? we <laughs> might we might be able to hear some kind. I mean, kind of a difference, but for us, obviously, that's more like overdoing things. So, um, one thing that I wanted to ask you is that kind of like you know when you have foreigners learning Korean. Um, and do you Koreans, and I'll be honest, do you Koreans make fun of Westerners trying to learn the language and getting them all mixed <laughs> up, just as we make fun of Asians when they get their ulls and the errs uh, mixed up? Actually, we do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very honest answer. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. It's also okay. It's kind of funny because, and Koreans also have trouble sometimes understanding Westerners because they just don't pronounce the words correctly and then we have to kind of decipher okay they meant this and not that <laughs> right right i mean this is pretty much the same that we have in um at least for english with asians getting the light and the right correctly right so you exactly. had to learn you had to learn how to hear the difference right yes yeah yeah <laughs> and and that is because korean has ill and er sounds but they're more allophonic rather than phonemic Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, oh, we've sorted <laughs> that out. Okay, so here's a dinner trick um, for my students. So, Yu Yung, <laughs> thanks very much um, for joining in and taking the time and for your excellent examples. I'm sure they're quite um, helpful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. See ya. <laughs> Bye. So the second um, example comes from Mandarin Chinese, for which I asked uh, Sarah. And uh, she's going to talk to you about um, difference in manner of articulation. And she's going to explain what the reach reflex um, sound is and a tone. So Chinese being uh, a tonal language. Okay. Hi, Sarah. How are you doing? Hi, Susanna. Yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you all. So yeah, my name is Sarah and I'm from Hong Kong. And I'm here today to give you some examples about minimum pair in Chinese. So let's start and you see if you can hear the difference. Okay, the first example, yeah, I'm now going to begin. Lao 
种，老种。So I try again. 老种，老种。So the first one means swelling, and the second one means boss. I, yeah, I mean the the difference is quite minimal actually. So I don't know if you can recognize the first one. The the second word, so the difference is at the second word, okay? And you have to roll your tongue with the first phrase, so it's lao zhong. So I've rolled my tongue with the zhong. But the the second one, lao zhong, zhong, I didn't roll my tongue. Okay. But, yeah. This okay. Is, yep. Yeah, this is the <laughs> first example. I, I couldn't and, hear uh, it, but uh, yeah, great. Yeah, the second example is, oh, you know, I th I think like Chinese is a tonal language, and of course, so I have to give you an example in tonal, like the difference. So if let's see if you can hear. So there are three uh, phrase here. So the first one is, ba ba, ba ba, the first one. The second one is, ba ba, ba ba. The third one is ba ba, ba ba. So I mean, I think you can hear the difference. But yep. basically, this three phrase they mean rice cake. The first one means rice cake. The second one means shit. So the one that you live in your toilet, and the third one means your father. And I think you don't want to mix up the second one and the third one. So otherwise, your father will be very angry, I guess. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that is, um, I don't know if I were to learn Chinese, probably the most horrifying thing, um, that you talk about your family referring to shit. Yeah, I, I think so too. But okay. to be honest, like, I think Chinese people are very used to foreign learner mixing up all okay. the tone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so like, you have this automatic correction mechanisms in yeah, your head. Yeah, yeah, we, we try to make sense out of context that, like, you know, don't mix up yeah, shit okay. and butter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you have one more example that you presented to me uh, in one of my classes because what my students don't know is that I invited you to all my interlink classes to uh, give the impression on tonal languages right in class. And uh, for years, you were re reciting my examples that I got off the web and off um, text box until you told me they don't really work I have this better example so um, off you go that's my favorite example actually yeah this is my favorite example too actually so again so two phrases the first one is the second one is so I mean now you can hear the difference I guess but the the difference in the meaning, well, the first one is a very lovely animal, an alpaca, and the second one is fuck your mom. <laughs> so you really don't want to mix these up. Um, and... Yeah. So next time when a Chinese send you an alpaca as an emoji, so don't don't think that he's trying to be funny. Maybe he's swearing at you. So, but you know, just to be not so direct. Actually, so alpaca has some other meaning in our language. Okay, and and you were telling me that alpaca at some point was a euphemism for swearing as well. Yeah, so yeah. now it's it's yeah. used in, in emoji to try yeah, yeah, and swear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you, you, like, okay, very frequently you can see like in YouTube of China that there is like a lot of alpaca running through on the screen, <laughs> and you maybe like why? Because actually they are swearing, but they just you know have to be a little bit more funny. Um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is still funny. I mean, even after all those years when I um of of hearing this example, um yeah. So it was quite a different experience now doing it over the web rather than mm -hmm. having you um <laughs> showing off your examples in class, yeah. which was always um um great yeah, fun, and I hope yeah. uh, great fun for my students as well. But uh, yeah, th Sarah, um, thanks so much for taking the time and <laughs> uh, sharing your examples. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure they're um, an excellent illustration of um, uh, Chinese phonology. Yeah, thank you. You're thanks welcome. Very much. You know, you're <laughs> thank welcome. you very much. And I'll Have um, fun, guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see you later. Bye. You, bye bye. Okay, that's it for the excursion into other languages. 
So yeah, what we consider natural um, may not be natural for other languages and vice versa. So uh, a ph the ph a phoneme inventory of a language is always language specific. Okay, so now we can briefly talk about where we can use this phonetic or phonological knowledge in, for instance, the analysis of morphology. So I gave you two exercises. If you haven't done them, you can pause the video um, to think about the following. Um, so what's the difference in the plurals of cats, dogs, and kisses? And second, what do you think happens in the in prefix of inadequate, impossible, irregular, and illegal? Okay, so um, we, we can start here with the definition or realization that a morpheme can be realized by different allomorphs based on phonological conditioning. What do we mean by that? The first one in the plural morphemes, if you listen very carefully, um, there's a very clear distinction um, or a very clear difference in the plural realization. If you were to transcribe these plurals, um, you would transcribe them very differently. Uh, so for cats, we have the uh, voiceless s, dogs, voiced, and kisses, right? We have a bit of a, um, an E sound in there for ease of articulation. That is predictable um, because the plural morpheme is preceded by the voice consonant or um, a voiceless consonant in, um, in, in that. And that influences which um, morpheme, which allomorph we use, right? So for the um, voiceless T, that takes the uh, voiceless um, allomorph S and equally g, z, right? So this um, rule, this phonological rule, similar to the aspiration and the um, d voice r that we looked at, is very predictable. And we know that without being um, taught. And it's probably time to introduce you to the uh, WOG test, right? So Jean Berko Gleason um, came up with this brilliant idea and it's iconic and it's been um, very influential in linguistics in general. She presented children um, as well as adults, but um, she wanted to know whether children know this this rule, this this uh, that you pick um, an, an allomorph based on its phonological environment. And uh, so she presented kids with pictures of the wog. So you, she used nonsense words because she wanted to avoid that children just produce the plural that she they had previously heard. And um, children are very good in producing th the allomorph that is consistent with the phonological um, environment. So um, yeah, for wog, they would produce wogs rather than wogs, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, so preschoolers were slightly worse than uh, first graders, but overall they did really, really well, which means that we internalized this, this uh, phonological rule without being explicitly um, told. And the wog test is um, now so iconic, you can get all sorts of wog um, stuff on the web, including uh, the wog mog. Okay, um, digressing a little. Um, for the second example with the um, not prefix, uh, right? So we also have a, uh, something that's called assimilation based on uh, the following sound. Um, impossible, right? So you have a, a bilabial um, sound to match with the per sound, which is also bilabial, uh, irregular, er sounds, and illegal. That's a process called um, assimilation. Now, in this case, it's obviously so lexicalized and it's it's been assimilated um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But it's the same principle you will also find in rapid speech um, that you have sort of temporary assimilation. So if you say get them very quickly, you would not say get them, but in rapid speech, you're more likely to say get them. So you have a, an assimilation of um, two sounds and that person um, likewise is that the two sounds become um, more similar because it is in rapid speech, it is easier. You are anticipating the new, the next sound and this sort of um, back and forth influencing uh, factor. So that's what you st would study in suprasegmental phonology um, as well. So if you um, wanted to uh, uh, talk about where has all your morphology gone, Okay, so as a summary for today, um, what I would like you to take home here is um, the realization that we organize this jumble of phones into abstract categories by um, talking about phonemes. Um, phonemes are meaning distinguishing, but they are, as being a mental category, 
not concrete, right? So they're realized as phones. So something that's abstract and mental is not actually realized, but the realization, that's what we call uh, phones. And allophones um, are types of phones and they're different realization of a single morpheme, but crucially they occur in predictable um, environments and predictable complementary um, distribution. Now, these phonological rules or patterns that we discussed, they may be different um, between varieties of English. And in fact, the whole phoneme inventory may be very different in varieties. And studying um, a, a dialect variety um, as opposed to some standard or reference variety always complicates things, obviously, in terms of phonology quite a bit. But the, the principle would be um, the same. It just you, you would be shifting your reference um, variety. So some sounds can also be in free variation, which is generally unpredictable um, by phonetic, in by the phonetic environment, right? So it may be predictable um, on geographical or social grounds, and we will talk about this probably a little in, in social variation. Um, but what the, what the key difference is um, between allophones and free variation is that allophones can be predicted by some phonological environment. Um, and these rules may vary between um, uh, var varieties or um, uh, languages, as such as we saw with the um, uh, phonemic contrast in Korean and Chinese. My final summary now is that concludes sort of the sound section of, of this course is um, one of my favorite memes. Okay, so that may be one of the hardest thing th things to undo is um, keeping letters and sounds uh, separate in your analysis.